The following program is a dramatic reenactment. Certain events have been altered and names have been changed. The story you're about to see is based upon first-hand accounts of the actual events. In the 1980s, the nation of Colombia is ravaged by violence, terrorized into submission by the world's most dangerous narco-terrorist, Pablo Escobar. When the Colombian army fails to stop him, the United States Navy SEALs are sent in to help. The mission to train the Colombians quickly spirals out of control, and the SEALs find themselves in the line of fire. In 1961, an elite team of special forces was created for covert operations on the sea, air, and land. Their missions have been kept secret for national security reasons. Who they are and what they do has remained shrouded in secrecy. Now, based on first-hand accounts of classified operations, these are the untold stories of the Navy SEALs. Medellin, Colombia, 1992. The people of Colombia enjoyed what little peace they could find in a nation plagued by a drug war. After a decade of violence, the Medellin drug cartel had the government on its knees. The man responsible was Pablo Escobar. As the leader of the cartel, Escobar's power was unrivaled. His $3 billion cocaine empire made him one of the richest men in the world. Escobar bought government officials like commodities. Those who could not be bribed were assassinated. The Medellin cartel murdered 400 police officers and public officials in a six month period. In the early 1980s, the government of Colombia cracked down on the cocaine trade. They began extraditing cartel leaders to the United States to stand trial. Enraged by the threat of extradition, Escobar retaliated with unbridled violence. He launched a campaign of assassination, kidnapping, and bombing. Anyone who tried to investigate Pablo Escobar was systematically gunned down. On November 6, 1985, he hired paramilitary guerrillas to launch an attack on the Supreme Court in Bogota. During the three-day siege, over 90 people were killed, including 12 Supreme Court justices. All files relating to Escobar's pending extradition case were destroyed by fire. During the 1989 Colombian elections, presidential candidate Luis Carlos Galán was assassinated during a televised campaign rally. He was an outspoken supporter of extradition. Two other candidates were also murdered. Assassins tried to kill a fourth candidate by putting a bomb on a commercial airliner. The candidate wasn't on the plane. 130 innocent people paid for Escobar's mistake with their lives. In June of 1991, the Colombian government and Escobar made a deal. Escobar agreed to end the violence and turn himself in. In exchange, 
the government banned extradition. But Escobar had terms. The prison would be of his design. He built a compound he called La Catedral, or the Cathedral. The prison's amenities included a bar, a soccer field, a gym, and several guest houses. Even the guards were on Escobar's payroll. The terms of the deal kept national police at least 12 miles away. Despite his incarceration, the drug lord was as powerful as ever. Anything and anyone Escobar wanted came and went without question. For Escobar, La Catedral wasn't a prison, it was a fortress. It saved him from extradition and protected him from rival drug cartels. It also allowed him to conduct business as usual. Even if that business included punishing disloyal associates. Despite his deal with the government, Escobar was still the most feared man in Colombia. Stories about the drug lord's excesses appeared in the newspapers. The Colombian public was outraged. It was obvious to President Cesar Gaviria that appeasement and containment had failed. He was now determined to put Escobar in a real prison. Gaviria ordered a massive raid on La Catedral to capture Escobar. An entire army battalion was sent in, 400 troops in all. But as the battalion approached the compound, Escobar was already making his way down the other side of the mountain. The most dangerous narco-terrorist in history had just escaped from prison in an SUV. Escobar's spies in the Colombian army had warned him in advance. They also made sure his escape route wasn't covered. <laughs> Escobar was now a fugitive and free to wreak havoc in Medellin. The Colombian government turned to U.S. Ambassador Busby for help. The ambassador was more than just a diplomat. He was also an expert in counterterrorism. Bienvenidos, Embajador Busby. It's a pleasure to see you again. Nice to see you. <laughs> Busby was about to receive an unprecedented request from President Gaviria. Okay, he'll see you now. Good. He wanted U.S. troops to secretly assist in the capture of Pablo Escobar. The American government had grave concerns about official military involvement in Colombia. But U.S. President George Bush approved a small covert mission as part of his administration's drug interdiction policy. Within days, an unmarked private aircraft landed at a remote airstrip in the Colombian jungle. Its cargo a team of highly trained commandos from the U.S. Navy SEALs and the Army's Delta Force. Oh, 
The men were taken to the United States Embassy in Bogota. If you have any questions, just let me know. Fine, right. that, that sounds great. To assure secrecy, Gentlemen. Ambassador Busby briefed the team in a soundproof windowless morning, vault. Uh, Frank, you will be working uh, directly with uh, Colonel Mejia. Commanding the mission, Navy SEAL Lieutenant Frank Venegas was a second generation Colombian American. He would work closely with the head of the Colombian secret police. Torres, you will be uh, in charge of providing... Second in command, Chief Petty Officer Andre Torres was an expert in covert operations. He would provide tactical training to the Colombian forces. In a nutshell, that means that no U.S. personnel participate... Members of the U.S. Army Delta Force would provide training on state-of-the-art surveillance and communications equipment. All right, let's sit down again. The team would have a strictly advisory role to help the Colombian secret police capture Pablo Escobar. Break down some activity. U.S. personnel could train, advise, and gather intelligence. Had some Escobar activity. They were prohibited from participating in combat. The Fialis, uh, section of the city. Also over here in Bella. The American commandos were ordered to confront the world's okay, most dangerous narco-terrorist uh, with both hands tied behind their backs. Buildings in this area. All right, let's uh, move on now to... They would work with an elite unit of the Colombian secret police, the search block. It was created with one purpose, to capture Pablo Escobar. Members of the search block were considered untouchable. They were beyond the reach of Escobar's bribes. Take a look at the post. Colonel Hugo Mejia, the commander, handpicked his officers. Their identities were kept secret to protect them and their families from assassination. Colonel Mejia was a hardened veteran of Colombia's drug war. He was skeptical of involving the Americans in the hunt for Escobar. But he needed their state-of-the-art surveillance technology if he hoped to capture the drug lord. The Americans presented Mejia with their secret weapon. It looked like an ordinary Beechcraft commuter plane. But inside, it was filled with millions of dollars worth of top secret electronics and surveillance equipment. The aerial surveillance mission against Escobar was codenamed Centra Spike. It was designed to exploit the one gap in Escobar's security. He constantly used mobile phones to coordinate his drug empire. Twenty thousand feet over Medellin, the aircraft's sophisticated electronics intercepted Escobar's encrypted conversations. code-breaking program quickly deciphered them. The aircraft could also pinpoint the source of the phone signal to within 400 feet. Once the signal was found, it took only a few seconds to generate coordinates for the source. Escobar's signal was pinpointed to a quiet suburb just outside Medellin. The search block scrambled for an immediate raid. They would surround the area on the ground and take him by force. One unit hit the house. Other units covered the roads in and out. Escobar was cornered. Or so they thought. The house was empty. He was never here. Venegas criticized the search block's tactics. The team was too large to be stealthy. 
Escobar's spies had surely spotted the huge convoy and warned him. Nada. Colonel Mejia defended his operation. He was never here. He was here. He believed he Central Spike to led to them to the wrong here. location. That is really a Luca Stuart. Él estuvo aquí para escuchó a hacer unas millas de atrás. As the Americans and the Colombians collided, Pablo Escobar was on the move. The drug lord had established a series of hideouts throughout the Medellin area. He also had a vast network of spies and assassins to protect him. Now, Escobar called that emergency plan into action. The first joint U.S.-Colombian effort to capture drug lord Pablo Escobar had failed. The problem is not my main. Navy SEAL Frank Venegas and Colombian search bloc Colonel Hugo Mejia faced an uneasy collaboration. Venegas questioned the Colombian colonel's commitment to the mission. No, nunca estuvo aquí. Lo va a tener que aprender, comprendes? Colonel Mejia assured Venegas that bringing down Pablo Escobar was an extremely personal mission. He showed Venegas photos of 65 search block officers he'd lost to Escobar's assassins. Escobar's men had repeatedly tried to kill Colonel Mejia and his family. They lived in constant fear. Venegas was convinced of the colonel's commitment. Mejia admitted he needed the SEAL's help. His men needed training. Only with mutual trust could the mission succeed. The U.S. Navy SEALs developed an arduous training regimen for the search block officers. For three solid months, they trained tirelessly. Tactics, teamwork, and marksmanship improved dramatically. They were ready for another raid. To catch Escobar, they would need to move lighter and faster. Venegas recommended a surgical strike force inserted via helicopter. The raid would commence as soon as Centra Spike located Escobar and confirmed that he was holding his position. Centra Spike pinpointed the source of Escobar's signal to a remote, unpopulated area north of the city. He was still there at nightfall. It was time to strike. Moments later, the search block deployed in a Colombian Army helicopter. Although it was a combat mission, they were accompanied by members of the U.S. team. Colombia's helicopter pilots were not yet trained in the latest night vision technology. U.S. personnel provided on-the-job training. Night vision revealed the source of the signal. A small house nearly obscured by dense forest. The team was forced to land the helicopter in a clearing several miles away. A small unit of six men would move in on foot. Bearing 110, we're going to have to go east. Okay, vete, vete. Vamos, 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 vamos. Venegas observed the search block's tactical skills as the team moved on the target. 
their training had paid off. searched the building. Escobar was nowhere to be found. But they found evidence he had been there. And recently. Esto es suyo. No. Esto es suyo. ¿Quién es entonces? ¿Conoces Escobar? Este tabaco es suyo. Pablo. Escobar always had a planned escape route. But this time the escape was a narrow one. He'd never come so close to being captured. Mejia and Venegas considered the raid a minor victory. They were getting closer. Escobar had been on the run for five months and was feeling the pressure of the hunt. He knew there was only one way Colombian forces could get so close with help from the United States. He wrote President Gaviria a letter and offered to surrender. But only on his terms. He would go back to prison, but only in La Catedral. He demanded that the search block unit be disbanded and every officer in it fired. If these terms were not met, Escobar threatened to unleash another campaign of terror. As usual, Escobar signed the letter with his signature and a thumbprint. The Colombian government refused Escobar's offer. President Gaviria would settle for nothing less than unconditional surrender. In response, Escobar went deeper underground. He stopped using his mobile phones and started using messengers to conduct business. This made it impossible for Centra Spike to track him. For three months, Escobar disappeared. Entre más alto rango, más alta la recompensa. Finally, in the spring of 1993, Escobar resumed using his mobile phone. Although his conversations were now brief and infrequent, Centra Spike found him. Once again, Escobar was located in the heart of Medellin. He had eluded capture for eight months and still remained in his hometown. Venegas refined the plan of attack. A ground surveillance unit would go in first to monitor the hideout. They needed to determine when Escobar was most vulnerable to capture. They installed high-powered remote cameras in a building a half mile from the hideout. The cameras transmitted their signal to a van packed with surveillance equipment. Yeah. 
este muchacho que está aquí, ¿quién es? Greg Hicks, the Delta Force electronics expert, was teamed with Search Block Sergeant Gonzalez. They studied the movement of Escobar's men over a period of several days, looking for gaps in his personal security. They also monitored Escobar's sporadic mobile phone conversations, evidence that he was still in the hideout. Venegas briefed the men an hour before the raid to prevent security leaks. At nightfall, the commandos would surround the hideout from all sides and hold their positions. They would strike at dawn, when Escobar was usually asleep. But as the mission was about to begin, Hicks eavesdropped on a call to Escobar's hideout. Hicks was stunned. Someone had tipped off Escobar again. This time the leak came from within the ranks of the search block. The mission had been betrayed by one of Mejia's most trusted officers. The raid was aborted. There was a traitor in their ranks. Now Mejia and Venegas would have to find him. Pablo Escobar had escaped from his luxury prison. The notorious drug lord was now a fugitive and free to resume his reign of terror. Navy SEALs and Delta Force commandos supported Colombian efforts to find him. After weeks of planning, a raid on Escobar's hideout had been compromised. There was a traitor in the Colombian secret police. The unit's headquarters was locked down and an internal investigation was launched. Every search block officer would be questioned. Locker, I'd ask for them right now, please. Mobile phones were confiscated. The camp was thoroughly searched. No search block officer was above suspicion. But the investigation went nowhere. None of Mejia's officers had the opportunity to call Escobar and warn him. Search block support staff would have to be questioned. Anyone even loosely connected with the search block or its officers was under scrutiny. A mechanic who worked on the airfield was interrogated. The call to Escobar's associates had been recorded. The mechanic's voice matched the caller's voice on the surveillance tape. The mechanic confessed. He admitted he had been forced to spy by a search block officer. He dared not resist. The man had threatened to kill his family. He gave Mejia the officer's name. But before the officer could be confronted, he was found dead. Escobar had infiltrated even the secret and protected search block. 
If Venegas couldn't trust his Colombian counterparts, the mission was doomed to failure. But Escobar had his own traitors. Welcome. Maria Montoya was one of them. Please, will you have a seat? Escobar had executed her husband, a high-ranking member of the Medellin drug cartel. Now, I understand that you might have some uh, information on the Now, Maria feared for her own life. Ask her what type of thing she has for us. She contacted the CIA and offered them a deal. In exchange for protection, she would tell them anything they wanted to know about the man who killed her husband. Maria's knowledge of Escobar's business dealings were impressive. Jose Leon. Jose Leon? She had also compiled detailed notes on the structure of his massive organization. Is all right? Thank you. Okay. With her help, they constructed an extensive chart listing almost a thousand Escobar associates. Pablo Estrada. His lawyers, bankers, Money launderers and assassins were named. So, uh, uh, Estrada and. Uh, Never before had someone from inside Escobar's organization dared to come forward. Okay. Let me post these very quickly and then we'll move on. In a matter of days, she provided more intelligence information than the Colombian government had amassed in 10 years. The search block changed their tactics. Instead of going after Escobar directly, they would dismantle his cartel. His lawyers and business associates were caught off guard. Evidence found in their offices confirmed their involvement in the Medellin cartel. Escobar's assassins, the men who did his dirty work, were more difficult to find. Surveillance teams combed Medellin neighborhoods following mobile phone traffic. After a week of searching, they got a break. They locked onto a signal and heard Escobar's most dangerous assassin identify himself. The assassin's nickname was Sicario. Feeling the heat, he was laying low in an apartment in Medellin. Within hours, the search block was deployed to the apartment building to make the arrest. As the raid began, the assassin was speaking to none other than Pablo Escobar. Sicario told his boss that he was being tailed by the search block. They were hoping he would lead them to Escobar. Escobar was amused. He informed Sicario that he was the target. The search block was after him. The element of surprise was lost. Escobar just told Sicario that we're after him and he knows we're here. Tell him to abort the raid. Abort la but it was too late. The search block stormed the building. Sicario was ready and waiting. <laughs> Members of the Colombian search block were pinned down in a gun battle with Pablo Escobar's right-hand man. The assassin was down, but the team was ambushed from below by more of Escobar's men. They were trapped and taking heavy fire. Chief Petty Officer Torres ran to the building to help. He was breaking orders to assist the men he had trained. Torres provided cover as search block Sergeant Ernesto got off a shot. 
the firefight was over. The assassin was dead. ¿Qué pasó? ¿Y cómo pasó eso? A search block officer claimed it was a lucky shot. Okay. But to Torres, it looked like an execution style wound. The search block officer stuck to his story. Colonel Mejia's drawer now overflowed with photos of dead Escobar associates. Most had execution style wounds even though the official cause of death was always listed as killed in a gun battle with Colombian police. Navy SEAL Commander Venegas suspected that his Colombian counterparts were behaving more like a death squad than an elite fighting force. But the search block was not the only group going after Escobar's associates. A group of outraged citizens began taking the law into their own hands, murdering as many as five of Escobar's associates per day. Los Pepes, or people persecuted by Pablo Escobar, targeted Escobar's friends, family, and property. They left their signature by hanging signs around the necks of their victims. Escobar's vast organization was shrinking. Five members of Escobar's extended family had been killed. Uh -huh. Escobar now feared for the safety of his own wife and children. He used his connections to quickly obtain visas for his family and their bodyguards. Bien. They boarded a flight to Germany. With his wife and children out of the country, Escobar was now free to retaliate. Despite all efforts to shut him down, more than half of his organization was still intact. Escobar put a price on the head of each and every member of the search block. The higher the rank, the higher the reward. He resumed bombing government targets. The country braced itself for a new campaign of terror. But Escobar was stopped in his tracks. Two days after they left, the family and their bodyguards were forced to return. The German government turned them away. Their arrival in Colombia created a media frenzy. With the press broadcasting their every move, they were at serious risk of assassination by Los Pepes. Señor Presidente, Pablo Escobar. The drug lord was enraged. He phoned President Gaviria and demanded government protection for his family. The family was moved to a hotel staffed by undercover search block officers. They would be safe from Los Pepes, but their conversations with Escobar could now be monitored. Just as the net was closing in on Escobar, the mission came under the scrutiny of the U.S. government. We appreciate you seeing us on such short... There was an obvious correlation between the people killed by Los Pepes and the search block's list of suspects. The third man, Ramirez. What can you tell me 
If the search block was indeed working with Los Pepes to murder suspects, U.S. forces could be implicated in the unlawful assassination of foreign nationals. Colonel Mejia denied any connection between his unit and the vigilantes. He suggested Los Pepes had gathered their own intelligence. Let me tell you what I think. The pattern is just a coincidence. Their suspects simply coincided with his own. Frank, your team is in violation. The Pentagon and the U.S. State Department advised Ambassador Busby of their concern. Okay. They feared the SEALs would be caught in the middle of an international incident. You are going to be replaced by conventional forces. They were pulling the plug on the mission. You will be leaving country within 30 days back to your posts in the United States. Venegas' team would be ordered out of Colombia just when they had Escobar on his knees. For over 15 months, a joint SEAL Delta Force team had assisted the Colombian secret police in their search for Pablo Escobar. Habla. Aha. Gentlemen. At the U.S. Embassy, Ambassador Busby relayed troubling news. U.S. Special Forces were about to be replaced by conventional forces. Violation, gentlemen. Now you will be replaced. Over a year of hard work would be lost. By conventional forces. Worse, Escobar would continue to terrorize the country. That's it. The SEAL Delta team had just 30 more days in Colombia. It was their last chance to get Escobar. They would have to do it without Central Spike's sophisticated surveillance aircraft. The plane had been ordered out of the country. Desperate, Venegas and his team improvised. They rigged a helicopter to carry more primitive electronic surveillance gear. The chopper was not nearly as accurate as Centra Spike. It was unable to pinpoint signals as precisely, but it was all they had. Once it located a signal, ground surveillance units were dispatched to the area to isolate its source. But Escobar had another trick up his sleeve. He routed his mobile phone signal through a more powerful transmitter. He had eluded them once again. Over a year on the run had taken its toll on Escobar. The search block and Los Pepes had reduced his massive organization to a skeleton crew. His cash flow was now a trickle, his bankers were in jail, and his money laundering machine was crippled. Escobar also worried about the safety of his family. He called them every night, usually at the same time. Jose! During one call, Sergeant Hicks got what he thought was a sure fix on Escobar's location. But it led to an empty intersection. Again, Escobar slipped through the net. With the search block on his heels, he was in constant motion. A few days later, the fugitive drug lord learned that the American surveillance plane had left Colombia. He let his guard down and resumed making calls from fixed locations.
the helicopter picked up Escobar's signal. Tenemos que esperar a dos millas. He was tracked to a suburban neighborhood of Medellin called Los Olivos. The best the helicopter could do was track him to within a 15 block radius. They would have to rely on the ground based surveillance team to pinpoint his exact location. The surveillance van spent two days prowling the streets of the city. Head east. Signal strength increases. Hicks and Ernesto scanned the airwaves, waiting to intercept Escobar's next call. I'm getting a signal. Okay, On December 2nd, 1993, they finally picked up his signal. They pulled over as the signal peaked. Escobar could be anywhere within a four block radius. Sergeant Ernesto studied the buildings along the block. Then movement in one window caught his eye. While Sergeant Hicks called for backup, Sergeant Ernesto covered the exits to prevent Escobar's escape. Backup arrived in minutes. Mejia and his men quickly surrounded the building, trapping Escobar and his bodyguard inside. As much as the Americans wanted to help, they were only allowed to support the mission from outside. Escobar and his bodyguard were alerted by the arriving vehicles. They escaped out a back window and onto the roof. But Escobar was now dealing with a superbly trained Colombian force. The search block closed in. The bodyguard laid down cover fire so Escobar had a fighting chance of escaping. The bodyguard took a fatal shot. Escobar was cornered. Escobar was hit in the leg and the back, but he was still alive. A search block officer put an end to Escobar's reign of terror. The official medical report said Escobar died from a point-blank gunshot wound to the head. The shooter remains anonymous. For the Navy SEALs and Delta Force, the mission was over. But the end of Escobar did not signal the end of the drug war. Today, rebel guerrillas partnered with new cartels have filled the vacuum left by Escobar's death. U.S. forces continue what the covert teams began. They provide training and intelligence support to Colombian troops in their ongoing effort to staunch the flow of drugs. In the controversial war on drugs, the United States Navy SEALs helped the Colombian government win a major battle. It remains to be seen whether the war itself will ever be won. <laughs>